Okay, great, it's working. All right, so um, basically my project is through um, children's literature. It's a um, it's one of my English courses going on right now, and mm -hmm. we had to pick a book to decide um, basically where we wanted to focus our project and the theme that we wanted to talk about. So something I wanted to do was through one of my favorite. Um, it it was like a it was like a um, like a graphic novel, you know, like I don't know if you ever heard of like. Uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, or just, you know, those kind of like cartoon-like um, novels, so mm -hmm. easy to read, but um, so basically what I wanted to talk about was um, racial justice and also um, how race plays a factor into children going through the education system, so I have a list of eight questions I want to ask you, and before that, um, just to get like a general overview of, you know, you as a person and a professor, um, I'll start with the first question, um, and that is, what is your profession, areas of interest, and your goal as a faculty member? Sure. Um, so my name is Professor Dexter Gabriel. I am joint appointed in the history and Africana department here at UConn. Mm -hmm. uh, my areas of study are slavery and emancipation in the Atlantic world. Um, and my goals here at UConn, I started here in 2016 on a tenure track position. My goal is to really um, build and expand uh, UConn's uh, his history department and Africana department in the disciplines and areas of study of slavery and emancipation, which was something that uh, neither department had a strong um, bench in previously. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. So. Um, what I want to follow up with that next is, um, you know, obviously with um, your area of study and what you want to bring to the table for UConn and going beyond yeah. that. So thinking about the book I did, it's it's a, you know, the graphic novel, it's by an author named Jerry Craft, who basically tried to put an autobiography into the form of this story. So the, the main mm -hmm. character is a child named Jordan Banks. And he goes through a private education system that's predominantly white and doesn't really have a, you know, a very diverse range of individuals. So talking about that and wanting to move to my next question and get, you know, your personal judgment and experiences. Um, have there been moments in your life from childhood to adulthood where you have experienced microaggressions, stereotyping or other racial incidents? And how did those events affect your path in life? Um, so yes, <laughs> all of the above at, at some point, um, you know, they, they came at different points. Some of them I may not have fully understood at the time. Uh, my parents moved us to Texas from New York, mm -hmm. uh, when I was in elementary school, they did not know Texas. They we were in Houston. They did not know, understand Houston that well, that Houston had these very segregated racial areas and the area that they took us into at the time was predominantly white and working class um, and did not welcome diversity. <laughs> uh, so um, my parents, for instance, would tell me later on that, you know, they would see cars with Ku Klux Klan stickers in the parking lot. Um, my mother and a, another African-American woman who worked somewhere at night literally had to run this gauntlet to get to the apartment complex uh, because people passing by would hurl racial slurs and throw bottles and things at them. Uh, at the same time, uh, during the school system, um, even from kids in elementary school, there was like a lot of racist jokes and these kinds of things, which I don't think I fully understood. I knew they were wrong. I knew they were offensive, but I didn't understand how to impact, how to take them. Um, it was really leaving that setting uh, when I, I left that setting by the time of middle school um, and ended up in a more diverse, predominantly African-American Latino uh, school district and neighborhood mm -hmm. that um, I probably thought about those things more and how they impacted me at the time. And, you know, I think I, I dealt with those things just uh, often defensively, often uh, tried to ignore them, often um, internally rather than, you know, expressing myself and speaking out. And that's something I think I would have to learn uh, later on. Great. So, you know, that it sounds like, you know, going through an area like that, it wasn't very welcoming. Um, so 
you know, obviously having gone through that and, you know, moving your, your way up, you know, here all the way to Connecticut as a history professor. And I think I remember you saying in, in our class last semester that, you know, your original plan was medical school, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the original plan. So um, obviously those plans changed. Um, so as an African-American professor, um, you know, continuing the conversation with your time as a child and going through, you know, high school and then university and moving up to where you are now. Um, as an African-American professor, where do you think the education system falls short of, <clears throat> excuse me, falls short of supporting individuals of color? And do you feel UConn fosters a positive and diverse environment? Yeah, I mean, you know, beyond uh, what I experienced in elementary school, um, I went through the public education system and, you know, there were hits and misses. There were certainly uh, educators who I thought were very nurturing and tried to think about um, the diversity of their classrooms and uh, the topics that they would bring up and what have you. And then there were others who didn't. And uh, I think that followed me through my collegiate career. And so often in my collegiate career, for instance, I didn't go to a school with an African, Africana or African American studies program. Uh, instead, what we would do is just try to take any course that we knew that might be related. So there was a course on, uh, in college, there was a course on African-American literature. I took the course. <laughs> there was another one on African-American politics. And so almost in a way, we had to make up our own African-American African or African-American studies program because there was no such thing. And so we would simply take courses and then, you know, read on our own. And that could be a hit or miss. You could read some great stuff, or you could read some things that were, you know, questionable. And so a lot of, in college, I think was a lot of self-discovery, um, a lot of being introduced to new things, uh, whether through the classroom or through my own learning and, you know, really negotiating my way through that. And so, you know, to answer your, your larger question about where I think things may uh, fall short, um, I would say that, you know, college is this place where people come, of course, to get the degree, they come to learn. Um, and you also come to experience new things. You come to learn new things. Hopefully when you leave uh, your collegiate career, uh, you have experienced um, new ideas and uh, new, in my case, new histories and new understandings of history. And so if there's a place I think the education system falls short is in fostering this uh, before the, the college uh, level, I have a lot of students who will tell me that the history that they learn in public schools was simply not adequate uh, uh, compared to the classes uh, that I'm teaching. And so, you know, I wish that the public schools would, of course, um, try to foster a more um, diverse setting in its understanding of history, even, even just American history. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that's a challenge because as we've seen in the uh, current political environment, uh, even those attempts at diversity are challenged themselves, as Jeffrey Kraft's uh, book, Jerry Kraft's, Jerry Kraft's book itself, yes, which yes. has been banned in several places, yeah. Really? So have you, you've, heard, you've heard of this book before? Yeah, Jerry Kraft, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually know him, not know him, know him, but we somewhere interact on social media. Yeah, his book has been, I, I'm, I, I kept up with the book being banned in several places, in several public school systems, yeah. Wow, that's uh, yeah. that that takes me back a little bit. So, you know, here, yeah, here um, about this book, and you already knew about it in places it's been banned. That's yeah, I have, I have. Well, unlike yourself, I haven't read it, and so I can't say I know about the book. I more so know the larger politics about the book, and right, okay. Uh, and so I've seen uh, things that Mr. Kraft has written about. You know, the shock that this book, where he's simply, as you said, just trying to tell of his experience is now being banned in, in places and seen as a problem. Yeah. 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 That's um that's interesting because I feel like um, you know, just, you know, not even looking at major news networks, I think with, you know, the new social media um mm -hmm. forms and and different ways that people communicate. You know, I think you just mentioned uh Reddit, but you know, whether you go on, you know, that or even TikTok or uh, you know, Twitter, I mean there's you know, I, I feel like there's so many like moving parts that sort of influence, you know, where this information goes and how yeah, people either definitely. support it or backlash it. So, wow, that, that's very interesting. Um, so 
and you know i could imagine too you know a state like florida with you know governor DeSantis, there's you know so many issues and, and it's also been banned in certain places in texas in a texas. town just outside of uh outside of my own um where i went to school right i mean not my, my school but others and so um and it's really been a shame because the parents appreciate the book and so it's a it's it's, it's this struggle between uh these school boards who for some reason believe they should ban it if, or whereas parents are saying we actually found this book quite helpful so yeah yeah um there's a there's an image in the book that uh really resonated with me or well not resonated with me personally because you know I, I can't speak for your experiences or or that of you know an African American African American individual in general but there was an image of uh one of you know the character Jordan's friends in the classroom um depicted as an Oreo so you know it was you know this very you know drawn out image of this you know black individual who was black on the outside but um, white on the inside, at least, you know, with the environment that he was placed in, in his private school setting. So, um, all right, great. Well, that's, um, that's very useful information, um, especially with you having a relationship with, um, Mr. Kraft as an author. So going next, um, still speaking on, you know, from your childhood to now and these experiences you've had, um, how do you think the world has changed from your childhood to now? And do you think for better or worse reasons? I guess that might be a broad question, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there are things that are better. Uh, so let's go with the good things first. Um, just in speaking of the book that you're reading, um, the diversity in uh, middle grade and YA books is amazing. As a person who grew up reading a lot of those books and even books that may have had um, brown or black figures. Sometimes those books were whitewashed, uh, like uh, thinking of Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea. Her main characters are in this fantasy uh, YA novel are black and brown, but the covers uh, whitewashed the characters to be white because they didn't think these would sell in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So I think you go into a bookstore now, you go into a library and the amount of um, literature there is for young readers is amazing. And the diversity of it, whether it's um, diversity in topics, whether it's the diversity on who's on the front cover, diversities in gender and sexuality. It's just, I think we're living in a golden age in some ways um, yeah, yeah. of this type of literature. So you can have someone like Jerry Kraft's book right. as part of this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the bad part is that I think related to that, I think you see a backlash, which tends to be a very American phenomenon. Um, whenever there is this advancement and there is this, uh, these rights or this diversity, this push, there's often a backlash, uh, to it, um, for people who believe that, uh, they are losing something with this or that it's going too fast for them. They want to slow it down. Uh, and so I think we're also living through that backlash among many others, um, because people have witnessed these positive changes in society. And I think uh, that that's a very American story in many ways. It's, it's, it's not the first time it's happened in the United right, States. Right. And, uh, yeah. And like it'll be the last. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting you bring that up too, because, um, you know, I think when you talk about how this is, you know, a, a very unique American circumstance, um, when I had the slavery and film course with you, I think it was pretty, um, you know, evident within, you know, our transition from, you know, the very, the very first film, which was, um, what, what was the exact name of it again? The Birth of a Nation, I believe. The, yeah. Right, The Birth of a Nation to the um, Jordan Peele film, jo sorry, yeah. Jordan Peele film, film we saw at the end of the semester, which was called again. Um, um, Get Out, Get Out. Get yeah. Out, right. You know, so, so from Birth of a Nation, and then, you know, we, how we looked at the adaptations and, and new cultural changes that happen over time to that movie, you know, Get Out, I think, you know, even in, you know, film, looking at it through that medium, you know, we see yeah. where, where things have changed, but, you know, still where things fall short, where, you know, mm -hmm. I think racism and, and different forms of it kind of manifest in different ways, you know, they may not be as violent and outright as, you know, say, you know, a lynching, but they may be some subtle comments and behavior that, you know, one may or may not realize is, is very harmful. 
<laughs> people getting very upset over a black mermaid for instance uh uh the <laughs> which uh happened uh recently with the cast of the little mermaid it's a uh, young black woman i think Floyd bailey and so i think you know when you have these conversations i was like i know grown people are not actually upset about a, a person that's a half fish and a half <laughs> human so what what is the conversation we are not really having here? right right exactly. what is it about what is it about this push of diversity that is making people frightened and feeling that they are losing something mm -hmm. that it's a zero-sum game that if there is a black mermaid now that's something about there's a loss to them and i think we can we and again these backlashes you're right they always happen uh there was a backlash to the women's rights movement uh there have been backlashes to the gay rights movement i think we are living through a backlash to lgbtq rights and gay marriage came about and so there's always these uh backlashes whenever you have the this uh progress and it's something that yes we as a nation we we struggle through each time mm -hmm. great so i think that's all very um relevant information and then you know so we talked about some of the, you know, the bigger implications, you know, moving from some positives with literature to the, you know, prevalence of, you know, what, what else is still going on in the world. So, um, so my next question, um, still following along the theme of, you know, African-American literature and, and thinking about this book and how I want to utilize this conversation, um, what value do you find literature to have on impacting racism, and do you think there are better ways to com to combat it besides what is currently available, whether that be through the literature itself, or mm -hmm. you know, standing up for you know these these civil you know certain civil rights movements? Um, mm -hmm. I think you know, seeing still in the media today, like there was recently a, a 16 year old um, African American high school student who was shot through a screen door. So. And, you know, it's it's always something that happens, you know, time and time again. So, you know, what do you think are ways that, you know, we as individuals and looking collectively as groups and standing up for these against these events, you know, what are, you know, ways that we can combat that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, in many ways, it's all hands on deck, right? And it's something that everyone has to decide is, is important and they want to take part. And I think you mentioned some of the ways People have had marches. Um, there are, of course, uh, calls to action. I think there has to be policy, right? <laughs> I always say the civil rights movement was not simply people marching. They wanted government policy to be enacted right. uh, to solve issues. And so I think, you know, there are political solutions, certainly. Um, there are social solutions. Um, and I think when it comes to literature, there's, there's ways that art and education, of course, is important, right? I think... Um, I always say, like, when the civil rights movement and the black power movement was happening, there was also an arts movement, a black arts movement that was just following right along, right, and creating literature and creating um, theater and different things, creating music. Uh, you think of Motown and so forth as impact on yes. the civil rights movement. So, yeah, I definitely think literature, of course, plays a role. Yeah, um, I think it it always has, just in the context. I mean, I would say this in many societies, but just even in the context of uh, the United States and thinking about African American history, you know, um, the slave narratives we read in class were forms of literature and forms of activism. And so I think um, art will always play an immensely powerful role. Um, and I mean, going back to Jerry Craft's book, uh, though he may not, however he may have meant it, the reaction that it gets, whether it's positive or the strong attempts to ban it, tells you that there is some politics at work here within it, right? That is a form of activism that people are either attracted to or repelled by. And so, yeah, I, I definitely think um, art is powerful and literature and words are quite powerful. Yes. Um, and, you, you know, I think it's interesting too, you know, t thinking about this novel, New Kid, um, how such a, you know, you know, this graphic artistic novel with a lot of, you know, I think intentional color and, you know, differences between you know the the white and the black students and just how you know this this very engaging children's novel with you know what i see as you know positive um factors towards you know addressing these issues to a younger audience how people you know in a position as high as yours and you know beyond that are saying no like we we don't want this 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 is 
corrupting our children and this isn't, you know, something that we need or want. So um, I think that's a good transition into my next question. question. So you as a professor, obviously you, you teach a variety of courses. Um, so do you think courses you have taught, have taught, such as the one I took with you, slavery and film, offer an exceptional outlet for students of all backgrounds to have these difficult and, uncom and uncomfortable conversations in a positive manner, talking about all the um, things yeah. we've discussed. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> you, you would be able to answer that better than me, but yeah, certainly I hope so. Um, I first uh, came up with the idea for this course um, when I was adjuncting actually uh, for a professor when I was in grad school. And uh, pardon me, I wasn't adjuncting. I was an assist. I was a teacher's assistant, and I noticed this was a course on slavery. And uh, this professor showed a film. In fact, it was uh, Kimada Burn, uh, the one with Marlon Brando um, that we watched in class. Mm -hmm. And when she showed this film, I noticed how students paid attention to it. Um, probably more so than they paid attention to the lectures, or powerpoints, or books. And and it occurred to me um, the power of film power of the medium of film in our very visual era. Um, I, it occurred to me also that film allowed people to have this medium between themselves to talk about something as complex and as at times awkward and socially awkward and at times socially uncomfortable as slavery, right? When we talk about medium theory, it's the medium, so it's no longer them having to talk to someone, but they can experience it through this film. And they opened up and spoke in ways that would have been hard for them to just speak. Uh, they would have felt maybe uncomfortable with speaking openly. And so, you know, otherwise, if we're reading a book, we're just having a conversation. And so, you know, I created that class because I thought it was, I, I said, you know, film is obviously, um, even if as a historian, I know that, as I've said in there, there's not a single film I've ever seen that is quote unquote historic accurate um, <laughs> they do all sorts of things um, but I realized that film was important film was a way that people saw the world and saw themselves and how they understood history I always tell people like um, once uh, like gladiator came out that movie with Russell Crowe I said um, forever um, how people perceived Rome in gladiators was going to be based on that film <laughs> I, said, or, um, I said nothing you said like I don't care if you you studied Rome and it no it was going to be based on that film and so just like I understood that I could talk about slavery and over over and over again but it was when people close their eyes they're going to think of Gone with the Wind they're going to think of plantations they're going to and so I have to I have to address that and talk about that uh, with people because uh, as I always say uh, historians educators we are not the final arbiters of knowledge. People get information from a lot of different places and one of them is these films. So all this to say, yeah, I hope I hope a class like that um, makes the topic accessible. And I like it because we can learn multiple topics. You learn a bit about the history of slavery in the United States and elsewhere, but you also learn about the history of media and media theory. And right, right. Thinking. So and hopefully teach some media literacy. So when you go and watch a film and you're like, why am I getting teary eyed at this film? Oh, it's that music. And they know it, right? Like when we watch Glory, I said like the music in Glory is so perfect. It's made there. Like even when Denzel sheds a tear, the crescendo. I said it's it's following you and pushing you. And so right. I want people to be able to look at these things and understand um, and interpret. You know right. how films are made and those kinds of things. So yeah, I hope the class was illuminating on many levels. Yeah, I think especially towards the end of the class, you know. Just a, a funny side comment. I thought for two weeks straight that the class was from three to five p.m. So every single day for like two weeks straight, I was showing up a half hour late. And then I finally figured it out. I was like, "Why is everyone here?" And the discussion's already going. I don't think it was two weeks actually, but um, you know, I remember when that was happening. I just thought you 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 had a, another prior engagement or something. <laughs> no, I I I mean I know a, an apology is overdue and unnecessary at this point, but I I just was like. You know why? Why is everyone already going on on you know these these heavy conversations? And then I figured out. I looked at my schedule. I was like, oh shoot, this is a two and a half hour class, not a not a two hour class. But yeah, it know. takes that long to go. As you see, it takes that long to go through things. It, at one point, they were giving me three hours. Really? Um, that's a long time to keep people. So yeah, no, I I loved that class because it you know for a two and a half hour class, you know it it felt so quick yeah. and. 
you know, what, once I felt a little bit more comfortable, um, you know, engaging with the topics and the conversations, I think, you know, that this class or that class we had together that you taught and I had um, black experiences in the Americas as well, you know, th those kinds of questions and topics. And, you know, when we looked at like media theory and how you can unpack those films more and have those discussions and understand, you know, where where these those ideas are coming from was, you know, it was very, very enlightening, you know, and I and I like to think that, you know, from where I may have been as a child and, you know, things I may have done or said in the past that were unacceptable, you know, being at this, you know, collegiate university level, I'm learning like, oh, you know, that that's these attitudes and these things that, you know, I didn't even know were a problem or, you know, had these very aggressive back tones to them. I see now as, you know, yeah. you know, all the roots, uh, all the roots of where, you know, they come from and right. where, yeah. you know, where the original um, STEM is. So I had a student tell me that about blackface. They said they could never understand why it was a problem. And then yeah. I showed them, we've watched them in Epic Notions. They were horrified. They yeah. simply had no idea. And this Epic is, Notions. yeah, this is why information is very powerful. Right, Sometimes right. if you can understand that, or I've had people before who may not have understood something they said was anti-Semitic, right? Uh, just didn't know the history of the term or the words. And, you know, it's always a learning experience. I said, Nobody's yeah. born knowing these things. You, you have well, to learn them. So yeah. My my in middle school, um, I had a friend's um, bar mitzvah coming up, and um, you know I I didn't know much about the the Jewish religion, but I remember kids used to like, you know, call him a penny pincher, and I didn't really understand what that meant. Yeah. And then you know at this point today, I kind of understand the, you know the the notions yeah. and you know where where those kind of um, you know, anti-Semitic comments are coming from. So, you know, like I said, it's, it's very helpful, you know, and it was, it was also a very fun class, you know, like, I think, you know, you made it very, um, comfortable for people, especially, you know, when you would, you know, kind of have that, like, you know, the addition of like your humor, because I think, I think with heavy topics like that, and, you know, the, the comedic relief was definitely, um, you know, it, it was, it well, some was, of those movies are ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, like, I don't think you can talk about the movie like Mandingo, for instance, without, you know, cringing yeah, and pointing out at times how ludicrous it is, even it if it's really a certain is. And, You know, right. even the movie Get Out, it's like, you know, I remember yeah. class, like, just laughing hysterically on so many different occasions. But um, I do want to mention quick, because I have the um, free version of WebEx. I do, I have two questions left, and I think we could get them done in 10 minutes, but sure. if you do have a little more time, if we get towards over 35 minutes, um, do you think I could set up a new link and just read sure. that to you? Yeah, okay. that can work. All right, just making sure. But if you have, you know, other um, obligations and priorities, but I don't see us going longer than, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. So yeah. that works. All right, great. So um, as, as a novel author um, of ring shout which um you know i think you go under a another life <laughs> right right yeah. um so as the author of, of ring shout um how did you address the ideas discussed in our conversation and apply it to your novel and how do you think these cultural issues can be addressed at an adolescent at an adolescent age so obviously what i'm what i'm trying to say is you know clearly your novel is aimed at an adult audience you know, whether that be, you know, people at the university level or someone who's just, you know, going through the library, you know, their bookstore and finds it interesting and brings it home and is like, oh, wow, I didn't know all that or this is interesting. But, you know, yeah. how do you think th those kinds of ideas, themes, conversations can be um, transitioned to a youth level, obviously, right. in a more developmental sense that, you know, there's just some yeah. things you know, a child physically and mentally cannot understand at a certain age, but. Right, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a complex, that's a complex issue, right? Yeah. So uh, Ring Shout has like the Klan and it has uh, racial violence. And that's a, that's a question that people ponder. Um, I can tell you that knowing that, um, I, I know that certain communities do that. I know the African-American communities who are like, when do I want to talk about racism? Is there a point at which I want to expose my child to that or mm. show them something like a lynching, right? Uh, do I want to expose that to them, expose them to that? And so, you know, it's the book itself was made for adults, but I have to say um, it's also in some, 
don't don't let certain people find us out, but it's also in some school systems. And so I have seen at least for um, high schoolers who they figure can handle it. I probably wouldn't recommend it for a middle schooler. I think that's a bit, right. a bit much for a middle schooler. But I think Agreed. for some mature high schoolers, I think the book can work. And, you know, I mean, I, I aim that book again as adults, but there are works, I think, that can uh, convey these things to um, younger audiences, if need be. I I think back, even though I didn't convey it always the best, I think back about my early, early days of reading X-Men comics. Uh, this is during when uh, Claremont was uh, doing the comics, and he was very influenced by the civil rights movement. And so, not, I mean, Magneto was so, so Malcolm X, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was so obviously uh, based on that. And so, you know, there was a way that, and comic books are written for adults, for youth, and there's a way that they could convey those ideas uh, through th through the comic book, you know, but keep it from getting as perhaps gratuitous or as um, R-rated as something like uh, Ring Shop might be. And so, you know, and I always think that, um, personally I think the younger audiences can tend to handle more than we give them credit to. <laughs> I think uh, many can handle these things and have a conversation. It might be more open to having conversations about it. Right, uh, right. So, yeah, I, I'm glad that there are YA books now. When I go in, I think of YA authors like Justina Ireland, for instance, who writes a fantasy, um, well, kind of horror story where um, uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg, the dead started rising. <laughs> so uh, you, it's basically a zombie uh, story, but it's also very much about um, African Americans uh, in Baltimore and in places like New Orleans and elsewhere. And it's about um, the end of slavery and all of these other things and issues of race and gender. Right. And all of that's in there. Yeah, right. Amid these zombies, yeah. <laughs> and it's for it's a it's a high, it's a YA book, and so yeah, I definitely think we can we can talk about these things uh, to younger audiences. Definitely. Right. Yeah. And I have other books that are. I had a book um called The Black God's Drums, which is uh set in this alternate uh, New Orleans um, in the eighteen eighties, and there are issues of gender, there are issues of sexuality and slavery and everything in there, and I wrote that book as a. Uh, it's just a regular adult. I don't even think I was thinking adult book. I just wrote a book. Right. Um, but the main character is 13. And it turned out that the book was also popular with middle, with uh, middle graders. Yeah. Who read the yeah. book and were like, oh, I can gravitate towards this. So, yeah, I definitely think there's a way. Great, great. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting how, um, you know, thinking about how, you know, you said that the novel you mentioned earlier, you know, was had characters that were zombies. and But, you know, they're talking about these, like, real historical events um, mm -hmm. you know, bringing, you know, like a, like a factor of fiction into, you know, how, how these narratives are written. So mm -hmm. I do have one last question, but it looks like the meeting's at four minutes from ending. Uh, the last question is like a pretty, is like a sum up almost like asking you, um, like for your advice and how you would, uh, you know, try to give some inspiration or hope to someone who may be struggling with these um, very, you know, pertinent racial issues. But um, do you mind if I um, stop recording this meeting? I will sure. end it and then I can start a brand new one so that we right. have a, sure. a, 40, a 40 minute clock, even though, you know, it won't go to that. But um, yeah. All right, great. So I will stop recording now.